if you don't have fire in your belly when you get up in the morning and you you can't wait to do what you do then it doesn't work welcome to this week's escape your limits podcast today we're speaking with a serial entrepreneur and creative visionary who is passionate about finding ways to break the rules and to stay innovative in the highly competitive fitness market When most businesses typically fail or seriously struggle, his resilience and positive mindset have driven his franchise group to become the biggest and fastest growing within the UK. Even during a global pandemic, his unique approach to business kept his staff inspired while the majority of his members continued to pay their dues. His organisation also inspired a nation to move by creating the UK's National Fitness Day, which is now run and organised by UK Active. So get ready to learn how to start up, build, sell and buy back a franchise chain with the chairman and CEO of the Energy Group, Mr. Jan Spatica, on this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Last March, when, when the pandemic hit and it became clear that I could either sit and watch the industry go into implosion and the business that I'd, I'd loved for 15 years go with it, or I could stand up and be counted and, 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 and work with a group of passionate people and a great bank to actually make sure that energy uh, had a great future ahead of it. Um, did I know? Did I know that we would have the success that we've had this year? No, I didn't. I, I couldn't have known. But did I have a confidence in the people in the business? Yeah, I did. Um, I didn't know how we were going to pull it off. I didn't know how we were going to get through such a bumpy period um, as a franchise business that doesn't have the depth of pockets of some of the own groups. No, I didn't have the answer to that question. I just had a confidence in the product, the brand and the people, be it the franchisees, the staff or the centre. Um, and they've not let me down. Um, so it's it's. My, I would say that the, the business escaped its limits. You know, if we'd have been trapped by our limits, we'd have gone out of business. But actually, we've now got a bright future ahead of us thanks to people believing. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. So, Jan, th- thank you so much for joining us on the Escape podcast. And, and, and I was kind of curious because, you know, I, I, I did hear that you sort of retired. And, I, and I, I imagine now that I'd be interviewing you sitting on a beach with a kind of pina colada or something in your hand. You know, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I get that question quite a lot, Matthew. I, I, um, I did try to retire. It was my, my aim to retire as close to my 50th birthday as possible. I managed to... Uh, achieve what I thought was going to be my retirement three months ahead of that when I sold uh, energy to uh, private equity. Uh, but I discovered three things. Uh, one, um, my li- my wife can't stand me being around that much. That's the first problem. The second thing is I don't play golf. And the third thing is, um, actually, do you know what? You get bored. Uh, so the reality is I, I spent a year or so in the back, in, in, on the back benches, and uh, I had the opportunity to buy the business back. Some would say in the middle of a pandemic, buying the business back would be somewhat questionable. But we've uh, we're very pleased we did it, and we're 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 enjoying getting some great success. So, t- talk to me about that retirement period because I guess it's something that we all dream of, you know. And and it and, and it's it's something that seems as though it's you know it's 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 a, it's a, a goal that we all aim towards. But when you know what, what was it like when? You know, you because I've I'm known. You know, you've been in this way longer than I have, and I and I've always seen you as a grafter. You know, you 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 always you know working hard. I see. You know, I've seen you in clubs when, you know, when when they were just sort of you know when you were just starting your business, and I've I've seen you as a hard worker. So what you know when you when you sort of signed that check, you know what what was the sort of feeling on your mind? Was it like yes, 
I've made it. This is what I was working for. You know, tell me about that. <laughs> it, it's really interesting because you do think that suddenly your life changes overnight. And and I actually do remember the day we completed. You know, it was a it was a mixture of excitement and sadness because it was the end of a or as far as I knew at that time, it was the end of a fifteen year journey. And you know, the next day you do look at the you do look at what's in the bank account and you do pinch yourself a little bit. But actually, it was a good week to two weeks before the wife and I did anything with it. You know, you you just you're worn out. Actually, you the process you go through in selling a business, especially a business that you spent so much time with, it, it is actually emotionally quite draining. Um, so I have to say, for a couple of weeks, although you might have thought that we'd been off, you know, doing some really exciting things, actually. I slept a lot and I, 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 I took a bit of rest. But then when, when it all um, sunk in, yeah, you know, we, we, we got the home we'd always wanted. We feel very privileged to live in a beautiful place. You know, the wife uh, did some lovely things that she'd always wanted to do. I got the car I wanted. So, yeah, you do the things that make you feel that you've achieved something. But actually the reality is you very soon miss the cut and thrust of it all. And uh, for me it was about eight months. Eight months, right. And, and, and what would you say is one of the, cause I, the reason I'm spending a bit of time on this at the beginning is there's, there's a lot of people, I suppose, uh, you know, a lot of people are going through a very, very tough time at the moment. And, you know, I, I must admit, I've, I've sort of thought, wow, you know, just what, what am I doing um, in some cases? But I, I suppose for someone that sort of, you know, ach achieved that goal, what, 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 what are the bits that you probably missed that, that sort of, got you up in the morning and 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 sort of you know i, I guess created a a life that you felt was really worth living yeah i, I suppose um, i when, when you're working really hard and you you've got a, an aim to to take retirement early and um, it always sounds so wonderful that you're going to have none of those stresses and none of those things putting pressure on you but actually once you get there you do miss it and and for me um i it wasn't it wasn't terrible because I, I had managed to um, position myself as a non-executive director in a number of different businesses. So I had the opportunity to help and, and support a number of businesses. But it's, it's not the same as running your own show. And that was difficult. You know, it, it was difficult to go through that transition. Um, but I, I also will say that it's hard when you're still on the inside of a business being run by somebody else. And I, I stayed on after I sold the business as a non-executive director. And I think many have found, I, I won't be the first one, I won't be the last, that found it very difficult to be a spectator inside a business that you nurtured for 15 years. And, you know, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, but thank goodness I did because it meant that I was on hand uh, when COVID struck and the opportunity came for me to buy the business back. Uh, with with support from, from our wonderful bank, RM Funds, um, we 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 were there to do that, and, and thank goodness for that, because it meant that we could actually be there for the staff and the members and everybody that we we cared about. Mm. So during that that time, my guess is you you've had you probably had a lot of time to sort of ref reflect and think about what you'd done and 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 and, and think about business in general. And I suppose it seemed as though an opportunity came up to, to get back into it. What, 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 when, when you sort of were, were making that decision to get back in, you know, w w was there any sort of key lessons that you've learned or opportunities that you've seen that kind of got you excited about going back into something, particularly at this time? You know, you almost like if you, if you look at the health club market, it's like, well, why would anyone want to get involved in that at the moment? You know, what, 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 what t tell me a little bit about that thought process. Yeah, I, I understand that question. Considering our purchase, uh, buying the business back came in June of 20, so right in the middle of lockdown. So, yeah, there was some questioning, including those quite close to me, is this the right time to be buying the business back? Um, but it was, Matthew, it was unfinished business. You know, the, the reality is um, we sold the business in the August of 19. The pandemic struck probably February, March, was the time we really knew we were in you know we were going to be into a very different marketplace and I, I i have to say that i had a real concern that i would see a business that i'd nurtured for 15 years um being sold in the august and not existing anymore a year later and that was kind of too much to bear i i, I couldn't even as a spectator i couldn't watch that happen and thank goodness uh we had a 
a fantastic um, set of investors and a fantastic bank that wanted to get in behind us and see us work the magic again. And uh, thank goodness so far we've been able to do that and we're not out of the woods yet. You know, everybody is finding this a very, very difficult time. Um, but we are, um, we are, we are certainly very proud of what our people have managed to achieve under almost impossible, impossible um, new parameters. Uh, we're thrilled with what we've managed to achieve in the last six months. And, and off camera, you um, you mentioned, I, I think I've got this number correct, but you, you, you said that you've been able to to maintain, you know, out of 100 or so thousand members you've got, you've been able to maintain uh, about 68,000 that have continued to pay. Is that is that correct? And how have you, have yeah, you managed um, to do yeah. that? So. <laughs> I have to say that um, I'm, I'm thrilled and, and somewhat amazed uh, at our success here. Uh, and uh, I'd love to tell you it's because we're just uh, really smart. But actually, in, in reality, I think they say that necessity is the mother of all invention. We didn't really have a choice. Um, we, we took a very different approach to the rest of the market, um, only because we had to. So when it became clear there was going to be a long-term lockdown, so we're going back to March of two, 2020, um, and it became clear it wasn't just going to be a few weeks. There, there was going to be a long lockdown. And um, we saw what the rest of the industry did, and we understood it. Um, there was a real concern that your members will simply cancel. And so what you have to do is beat them to it, and you have to freeze their membership. You have to tell them we won't take any more payments, and then you simply hold your breath, and you wait until you can open the clubs again. Now, I know that various groups have published their numbers, and there's some scary numbers out there about the amount of money that's been burnt, you know, 9 million, 4 million, 3 million per week. Um, and if you are a large, well-backed organization, you might not want to, but you can at least access the resources that allow you to do that. If you're running a franchise organization, you simply cannot ask your franchisees to do without income for an indefinite amount of time. It just isn't an option. So um, I would love to say it was a great idea we had. But the reality is that's not really true. In both of the businesses that I was heavily involved in at the time that the pandemic hit, one is Energy, where I was at this time a non-executive director um, working for um, a board uh, that was being operated by the private equity company that bought the business. Um, and for BMF, uh, that's the, bus the, the business that I, I am non-executive chair of. In both cases, they're franchise networks. And so there was no way that the franchisees could simply do without revenue. So instead, we took a decision. We would, we would back ourselves and we'd back our franchisees. And we we believe in the difference of engagement in an owner-operated business. So we simply went out to, to the membership and we said, uh, you're aware that we're a franchise business and therefore your local club is run by a passionate local owner. And that passionate local owner has staff and they have livelihoods to protect and they have families and they can only sustain this club with your help so if you want your club to be there long term we're going to need your help now please if you are facing financial hardship yourself if you are struggling to pay the bills then please freeze don't cancel and we fully understand and we'll be there for you when you're ready for us but if you can afford to pay the membership continue paying then we promise you we will deliver into your home the most amazing online services. And then we proceeded to build those online services. And to our absolute amazement, um, in both BMF and in Energy, we managed to sustain huge numbers of members, um, huge percentage of members. At, at the beginning of the first lockdown for BMF, it was about 87%. For Energy, it was, say, 67%. And we started with Energy with 140,000 members. Um, and we we now have seen that reduced through the three lockdowns. But I think we ended the first lockdown with a, with something around 86,000 uh, members still paying. A second lockdown around 75. And now we're at around 65,000 members. And that's not paying a reduced price for an online service. It's paying full membership price. Um, and that's taken an awful right. lot of hard work, not only from centre, but also from the franchisees themselves and their staff, um, making it worthwhile for a member to pay full price membership, but have their service delivered in a different way. 
so put simply, Matthew, we said, yes, our buildings may be currently closed, but our, our membership most certainly isn't. We're just going to deliver it to you in a, in a different way. Uh, I've got two things that, that maybe um, tell you why it's so amazing, I think, the, the results we've achieved here. The first one is um, the number, on, on, again, across Energy and BMF, the number of members that actually wrote to me and asked whether they could pay twice. Could I pay double? Because members wanted to support other members. So we had members who were offering to pay for somebody else's membership who couldn't afford it. That was amazing. That was not invited, but it happened. And the second one was we started to see many, many people joining our online platform from overseas and suddenly realized that both BMF and Energy had a real loyal following of people that had left the country. Um, much like you, Matthew, and um, expats who, who actually heard that we were online and suddenly could access their favorite program again. And um, I, I was touched. I don't mind telling you, I, I was so touched that I didn't quite realize that there was so much engagement with the members on the ground. Um, and if ever I doubted that the owner management in, engenders that, I think the proof was right there. Yeah, I love that. That's, you know, it's fantastic on a, on a number of levels. I think, you know, the first thing that strikes me is that, you know, when when everybody thinks, you know, there is no options. Um, and, and I've been on a lot of conversations where it's like, look, you know, we're not a restaurant. We can't do takeout. We've, we've got to close. Um, I've, I've, I've heard that several times. And I think what you, what you guys have done, particularly to keep the same membership, is, is phenomenal. But I think more importantly, it, it says a lot to... To the community, the people in your organisation, and the relationship you have with your members, where they're they're sort of almost willing to support the businesses. You know that, that that's that's beyond um, just being clever and innovative. You know that that really sort of says a lot about what you know the value that your business is providing. Yeah, I think what we, I think what we discovered is we discovered the members the members care about the franchisees and the staff, but also the members care about each other, and that really surprised me. Because it's not the way we really think of fitness, that, that members are there to help members, but but they are. And look, we're not the only brand that has really good engagement. There are some fabulous brands across the sector. But I think there's nothing to beat owner management. You know, reality, um, if you go out with, with, with your wife to for, for a great meal, I'm betting it won't be to, you know, a well-known chain. It will be to a, a local owned restaurant where you know the owner, he remembers what you order. You know, you want that level of engagement. And that's difficult to do in a large brand run from center. It's a very different situation when the ownership and the passion is on the ground um, in the location. And that's what I think we, I would say, accidentally leveraged. Right. Do you think that that's... In oh, real sorry. Terms, sorry, what it does mean in real terms is, look, yeah, okay, so we were... Previously, as a network turning over for energy, let's say, uh, two and a half, three million pounds a month, and now we're turning over a million pounds a month. So it's still a lot less than it was before. But without that, we wouldn't be in business. It's, it's, it's that simple. Do you think that that's a result of the franchise model and, and some of the, the sort of um, results that those types of businesses offer compared to a you know like you say a, re a regular chain or is that something that you you know it's clearly something you must be doing in terms of working with your franchisees and the training and the philosophies that have, that have resulted in that you know what, what what are you what are your thoughts on on you know how that sort of how, how that sort of looked is um materialized sure um look I, i've been in um I've been in franchising for around 15 years. So whereas I, I still consider myself to be a student of franchising, in fact, Matthew, I still consider myself to be a student of the fitness sector. It's changing so rapidly. But I think what I've come to realize is that the, the part of the sector that we've chosen to be in, and I, I think the real reason I've ended up being involved in two fitness businesses that are both franchised, is I love franchising. I love the nature of it. I love the difference that it makes to the members on the ground. But most importantly, I, I love how much it it releases people to achieve their own dreams. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, um, 
It's a Jew. Energy's purpose is is has been the same for fifteen years: empowering people to transform their lives. You might you might notice it doesn't say fitness anywhere in there. Um, it's empowering people to transform their lives. We see that as being. It's aimed at three groups of people. Uh, it's aimed at members uh, because we think there's some amazing transformational change that our franchisees and their staff uh, do with members on the ground. Um, it's also about staff and, and empowering staff. Uh, to be the best that they can be. We've got great examples of a member of staff who aspired to be a franchisee and then actually became a franchisee and, and their own business owner. And, and then we've also got those people that have worked on paycheck dependency for the last 20 years and suddenly get the opportunity to sack their boss and go it alone. And it's a great thing to be in business for yourself, but many of us um, find that it's also a very lonely place to be. Well, franchising gives you that opportunity to both be in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And so it's that kind of middle ground where everything you're doing is for you and your family and the people that you love. But actually, you're not on your own in it. You're part of a community. And I, I think that's the magic of franchising. It's, the why, it's why the banks love it. It's why, it's why so many of the biggest brands in the world are franchised, because you can create that owner operation and the beauty of the um, of the um, engagement that you get with local owner management, but with the power of a big brand. Um, that's why I love it so much. Hmm. What, what does it take um, from a leader's perspective to be successful in a franchise business as opposed to a, a, a regular sort of owned um, you know, fitness chain or whatever? Yeah, so it, it is, it's a different business. It has to be said. Um, interesting enough, I, I think um, if I'm honest um, about why I've ended up owning the business again, I, I think that when you buy a franchise business, you have to understand it's a franchise business. Um, yes, it, it has fitness clubs as its product, but it's a franchise business at its heart. And that means you have to understand the nature of franchising. And it, it, is, it is easy for people to think it's, it's a simple task. You know, you just have one successful business. All you have to do is sell the formula to somebody else and go cookie cutter. And it looks easy. You know, if you look at the outside of the box, that looks simple. But it's hard work. You know, you, you have to be on every single aspect of that business every day to get it right before you can franchise. Um, if I look at ourselves, it took us 15 years uh, to get to a position where we could get to the size and value we were but it probably took us at least 10 of those to, ju to just get onto the runway. Um, so the reality is it takes longer than you think. Um, and that's the, one, that's the reason, actually, that I think master franchising, so becoming a, uh, a country franchise for a brand that's already established, has proved to be so popular because it's hard to build them from the ground up. Mm. You mentioned that fitness isn't in your... Your, your um, I'm not sure with your vision or mission core statement. Purpose. It's not in there. Um, what? Sorry, it's the core purpose. Our core purpose. Core purpose, right? And and I suppose from what I know, and I don't know a lot about franchising, but I, I guess you know, franchising seems to me as though it's something that appeals to kind of people who want to get involved in business, you know, investors or whatever. So so it seems as though they get into it um, from a business perspective um, as they see that as a better option than, than working for someone what part does the and, and, and as it relates to your earlier comment what what part does fitness play in that whole story you know is it is it primarily look this is a vehicle for you and and to have a, a better sure. life instead of, uh, of working for a job or, or is it really look this is a fitness business and you kind of need to be passionate about fitness and what it does you know, which one comes first and, and absolutely and how, that. I mean, how you learn from those sort of yeah no it's absolutely that I, I i have to say that whilst um fitness doesn't doesn't belong in our core purpose because we see fitness as a a vehicle for what we look to do which is to empower people to transform their lives you have to be passionate about fitness if you want to be an energy franchisee you have to be passionate about fitness if you want to be a bmf franchisee the reality is um, without being passionate about the products, if you don't have fire in your belly when you get up in the morning and you you can't wait to do what you do, then it doesn't work. Now, there are different styles of franchising. So we have people within our network 
who are what we call hands-on franchisees. You know, they're up at six every morning in the gym, actually doing physical sessions, they're hands-on. Um, some would call them mom and pop. They're, they're, um, they're not aspiring to have 55 clubs. They're maybe running in one club really well. You also have investor franchisees where they employ people um, who run a group of clubs for them. But the key is that latter group need to be able to train their managers to act like owners. There has to be a decentralized approach to it. The, the, big, difference, the, the big difference comes when that, that member who says, oh, the, the mats are, are ripped and they need replacing, and the manager says, well, I've told head office three times they don't listen. And in an own club, that tends to be, we'll sort that this afternoon, and it's done. And, it, and it's, that, it's that difference of caring because you own that end outcome. And, and that's the thing that makes the big difference. Um, if, I, if I was to um, tell you why I ended up in franchising, it's quite simple. Twice, I built a group of clubs. And twice, each time I expanded, the, the product and the service got worse the more we expanded and the further away I was from the furthest away customer and the furthest away member of staff. Um, and I, I got to nine was the maximum I ever got to before I could see a diminishing quality in the product. Whereas with energy, we can have 100, 200, 300 clubs and there will be no diminishing quality because it's not reliant upon me or anybody at center. And it's that decentralization that makes the difference. And if you look at a Domino's, if you look at a McDonald's, a KFC, or if you look at um, um, something like a, let's, let's say, uh, at the, the bigger end, the uh, Hilton Hotels and Intercontinental Hotels, it can be a sandwich shop to a hotel. It all works on the same principle. Decentralize the passion and systemize the things at center. Ray Kroc put it really well. Ray Kroc, the founder of, uh, <laughs> well, questionably the founder of, if you've seen the film of McDonald's. <laughs> He, he said two things that make me, they still tickle me to this day. He said, I've built a multi billion dollar organization run by teenagers. And, and what he meant by that is it didn't need to have extremely skilled and experienced people serving in the restaurants. Because he said, I've got an extraordinarily good system that can be leveraged by average people rather than most organizations most organizations needing extraordinarily good people in order to leverage average systems. And so I, I think that that's, that really, in essence, is franchising. If, if you make your systems good enough, then it doesn't take somebody that's superhuman to make it work. And actually, instead of the entrepreneur having to concentrate on building systems, they concentrate on their staff and they concentrate on their members. Um, a good example would be, um, and, and there are different sorts of franchises. Not, you know, um, uh, fast food has been the the big uh, benefiter of, of franchising, um, and we we get a lot of crossover. We we have uh, franchisee two guys, Jeremy and Torben. They uh, they were one of our early franchisees uh, in our history, and they have five subway stores, and those five subway stores um, gave them the opportunity to have a good lifestyle. Um, and they, they, they had profitable stores. It was great. But what, what I never knew until later was in their hearts, really, they, they were running sandwich shops, and, and that wasn't what they were passionate about. But it paid them a good living. Well, when they opened their first energy club and it made twice the profit of all five subways put together, well, that was the time for them to then sell their subway, subway empire and, and, and start to expand their energy empire. And, and what was interesting was about a year after they became franchisees, they'll kill me for telling this story on, on, on live, live podcast, but I'll do it anyway. I, I can owe them a beer. They took me out for dinner and they said, look, we just wanted to say thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to do what we're doing. And they knew it was all they're doing. It was not me. They did it. They worked the magic. But what happened is they'd gone from being in a business that made them money um, but wasn't necessarily their passion into a business where they could make money and they were passionate about it. And it's when you put the passion with the ability to make money, that's when the flywheel starts turning. And that's what we've seen in all of the best franchisees. But anybody that tells you that franchising is a ready-made, it's, it's some you know magical formula where everybody makes money, it's just not true. 
Um, you can fail in franchising, just the way you can fail in any other. You have to follow the system, and you have to have a little bit of luck on your side, and most importantly, you have to graft. So anybody that thinks that they sign a franchise agreement and money just begins arriving in their account, it doesn't work that way. It's hard work. It's graft. And if they're not willing to put in that graft or they don't follow the systems, they can fail just like anybody else. But franchisees that are passionate, yeah. they're willing to put them off, and they'll follow systems, and they have a wee bit of luck behind them as well, are the ones that will do the best. So when you came from a, a traditional business, <clears throat> own, owner owned business yourself, and then came into this franchise, obviously something appealed to that model to you. And I, I suppose like anything, you know, we do our due diligence and we kind of think, okay, this is a, this is a great strategy of vision. I like this. This is what we should do. And you, you went on to, to build it. And what would you say is one of, one of the sort of surprises that as a, as an entrepreneur, you you sort of misjudged and you know didn't realize before you was getting into it but found out later great question on the road. great question okay so the the first one was i assumed that if somebody was going to enter into a franchise they would enter into a franchise because they understood that they needed that brand and that system to help them and so i assumed that nobody would ever enter into a franchise agreement and then do it in a different way or, or think that there's a different way of doing it that's different than the system, because that would just seem to be ludicrous. <laughs> but it happens. You do have people that enter into a franchise and then that then look to do it a different way than the tried and tested way. And I, I think that that's because sometimes people get passionate about the brand and about the idea of running a fitness club, but really want to have their own freedom. Now, that's fine. There's no problem with that. But they really should start their own clubs. They they shouldn't they shouldn't go into a franchise. You you wouldn't open a McDonald's and then want to introduce a banana burger because you like banana burgers. You'd go with their menu. You'd go with their formula. Well, it's the same in any franchise: hotel, sandwich shop, fitness club. It's the same. So that was the first thing. I was really surprised that people would actually enter into a franchise and then try and do it like an independent. That was the first thing. The second thing is. Um, you do get a bit of a honeymoon period. So at the beginning, um, when there's all the excitement of people coming on board as franchisees, um, actually it seems almost too easy um, because at the point at which they're coming on board as franchisees, um, you've got all the excitement about what's coming, but you don't have any of the hard work. But it was actually year two when actually now we've got all these clubs opening and all of the problems that come with lots of club openings that you suddenly start to realize, yeah, it's just as hard work. You have to put in the same amount of graft. It's different graft, but it's the same amount of graft. And I think I think that was a surprise to me because the first year was just so easy. I, I, I didn't expect it to become so hard work in years two, three, and four. Um, and the, the third thing that was a surprise to me was, um, I'm not sure if you know the background, but when I started the business, I started the business with... Um, with a couple of friends, and one of those people was Steve Philpot, the former chief executive of David Lloyd. And Steve had had a lot of experience in franchising from his Whitbread days. And then um, we, we just couldn't understand why nobody had ever franchised fitness clubs. When we started Engine in 2003, there was no fitness franchise in Britain. Um, Gold's Gym had made a small entry into Britain with five clubs, but had not really gone anywhere. And so nobody had really made a success of franchising over here. And so Steve and myself and, and David Beatty, one of the other founders, we did a lot of research and we looked at America, we looked at Australia, and we looked at Canada, and we suddenly realized that fitnessing, fit, sorry, franchising was absolutely all over the world. It was a successful formula, but it just never been done in the UK. So I was shocked to understand that we were the first. I thought, now we're going to find somebody else is doing it, uh, but they weren't. Now, we were copied by a few, non, non very successfully. But what we did do is, um, it'd be fair to say we woke the sleeping giants. And it wasn't long before mm -hmm. any time fitness, snap fitness, jets from Australia and others were all coming into um, the, the franchising market in the UK. And, you know, the water's warm. We, we, we've seen huge expansion of franchising and fitness clubs in the UK. And so now all of our competitors are either american or australian imported franchises um, and some really good ones um we're different we do things a little differently 
Uh, but we're very proud of the fact that we're the the only large scale fitness franchise that's of British um, uh, British heritage. So that that leads me on to international expansion. I, I know now you guys are, are, are more than than the UK. What what was the thought process about that, and and what what are the pros and cons of a of a business going from a sort of you know base within a country and you know same language culture in in in, in a lot of respects, yeah. and um, and then to, to sort of try and go into somewhere where you've got language and culture and and, and distance and and everything else that that, that goes with it. Um, we we actually. Um, I've, I've been doing international franchising for, for some years, but it was always very opportunistic. And it sounds odd to say that we've been master franchising internationally and then mentioned Scotland, because one wouldn't think of Scotland as an international venture. But if I, if I was to say to you that even within the United, uh, United Kingdom, it proved to be very, um, what would you call it, territorial. So we, in about year five, um, suddenly woke up to the fact we had one site in Dundee and no sites anywhere else in Scotland, but we had 50-odd sites in the UK. And that was purely because we had one lead from Dundee that bought a franchise, and off they went. So somebody approached us. They said, um, could we do Scotland? We did a master franchise deal. In the next 12 months, they opened 12 clubs. Why? Because actually Scottish people like to buy from Scottish people. There was a Scottish head office, and they were able to actually localise it. They were able to look at the local market better than we could. And then we did the same thing in Ireland. And it was most definitely much better to run a head office out of Dublin. So what we discovered there very early on is you had to have localization. The biggest lesson we probably had was Qatar, where we, we went into Qatar. Uh, we opened uh, a club there, but we did it very differently than many of our counterparts, like Fitness First did. Many of our counterparts went in and imprinted the model that was in the UK in Qatar. Uh, we opened a men-only club uh, with an ablution area where you could wash your feet before praying. Um, that was a development that came about because I went over to Qatar and in the early development I saw shoes everywhere and I saw um, people washing their feet in the sinks. And I, and I said, what's going on? And they said, well, th th this is part of the culture. And they wash their feet in the sinks, they put their shoes out here and then they go to the prayer room. So we created an ablution area not because we knew how to do that, but because our local franchisee knew that's what people wanted. And we were the first fitness club in Qatar to have an ablution area uh, through to a prayer room with, with shoe racks. Well, that came because of local knowledge, mm. not because of what we knew. So it was the magic of taking our system and then being humble enough to recognize that local knowledge was critical. I think the big difference that comes on international on our international strategy now is it's deliberate. So whereas before we ended up with 22 sites in Ireland and 12 sites in Scotland and one site in Latvia and one site in Qatar because it was inbound, it, it was coming at us. Uh, we've now appointed the amazing Rod Hill, who you'll know was previously in charge of European expansion for fitness first. Latterly, he took Anytime Fitness to 40, 50 sites in Spain and then latterly has been very successful with the Tribe brand uh, taking uh, with uh, with the Tribe team, uh, the Tribe products into Spain and further afield. Uh, well, well um, we're very, very blessed that we have Rod, not only as our master franchisee for Spain, together with his business partners, George and Eric, um, but he's also taken up the role as international managing director. So he's now overseeing all of our international expansion. Now, just in Spain itself, um, when you look at Rod's background with Fitness First, Anytime Tribe, and then you look at um, the background of his partner, uh, George, George was the CEO of Basic Fit, taking it into Spain. Um, so he took the, um, the Spanish Basic Fit business um, into its uh, entree into Spain. We've got an incredible team in Spain, but we've also got um, we've got Rod in charge of our entire international expansion, and he's already starting to make that move. So we've just recently opened our first site in uh, India, uh, in Lucknow, uh, which is in the north of India. Uh, we are open in Bahrain. We we have our first site in Bahrain, and we're about to open uh, our first territory in California, 
uh, with somebody that I know you would know, Chris Stevenson, who, who is an amazing speaker, but also um, an amazing club operator who was, I, I believe, the first operator in North America to get a net promoter score of over 70 uh, and uh, is now taking not only the BMF brand into California, uh, but the energy brand into California once the market opens. Right. So in, in terms of that expansion, I think I think I, I can I understand what you said. You know, when we started, it was very much, you know, you get these leads from around the world and you'd be kind of like, oh, yeah, excellent. You know, we've got got people that are interested in this when, when you're sort of growing. And then I suppose as you as you get big, you realize the challenges that, that come with that. Um, as a you know, if you if you look back or we're, we're advising people that are probably going through that journey, again, is do you have to be quite careful? In terms of that expansion, you know, how quick you, you go internationally in the countries that you choose, because I suppose with a franchise, it's very much about systems and those systems come from, you know, really knowing the market and, and, and dialing everything in to a, to a very, very high level. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I look back to when we opened four, four of our women's fitness clubs in Latvia. Um, and, you know, you suddenly come to the realisation that you've made a market entry internationally into a country the size of Wakefield. Um, and you, you kind of realise, actually, was that the right thing to do? Um, so you have to think very carefully about your international expansion. Um, we, we've got a very simple set of rules, and they seem to serve us very well. Um, we won't go into a country where we don't have a fantastic local management. That local management could be a master franchisee looking to take our brands into that country, or that local management could be a joint venture partner, but there's always um, a very experienced localized management. Um, we've, we've learned through bitter experience, you have to have that. And once you've got that, you then have to also realize that you have to go one step at a time. You have to firstly build your first club. You then have to localize it. You have to listen to the market. Uh, you have to adapt. Uh, you have to be humble enough to know that what works in your homeland doesn't necessarily work there. And you, only when you've got that product right do you then roll. Rod knows that. That's why we took Rod on to head the international business. Neil King, our MD for the UK business, has done a fantastic job of ramping up our rollout of a known product. Rod's job is to find the right management in the right countries, adapt, and then roll. And um, that's the most important lesson that we've learned. I think the final thing is this. Um, there are some countries um, that are just hard work. You know, um, I know many people have tried to get into China. Um, the Chinese market is very difficult. You have, it, it's so culturally different. You have to be, you have to be brave. You have to be brave um, to, to enter a market that you really, truly don't understand. I, I've keynoted at China Fit and I've keynoted at Ursa in China. I've been to China many times. I still don't understand the marketplace. And uh, I, 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 would, I would need to understand it a lot better before we made a market entry into China. Whereas within India, it's actually a much, it's a much simpler market to understand. And although it's very different than the UK, it's not a mystery. And with the right partners, we've got a fantastic partner. Our partner summit in India was formerly uh, in charge of uh, multiple goals gyms in India. Um, we've got the right local partner, and, it, and it's that that makes the difference. So, yeah, it's our brand, but it's local management that makes the difference. Mm. How, how have you approached the, the product itself? Um, so I, I guess, you know, 15 years ago when you started, the industry was quite different. Um, it was fairly straightforward in terms of, you know, a gym would have a cardio, a strength area, maybe some free weights and, and, and potentially a few, like a little stretch area and stuff. And over that period of time, we've seen the boutiques enter the market. Uh, more recently now, people are doing outdoors. And I guess the part of the challenge when you introduce things like um, group training and, and things like that, there's a... Uh, it, it, it's, it's almost like a different skill set and, 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 you know, getting the right staff and being able to deliver the right products and do it in a consistent way. So how have you, what, what lessons have you learned from, from sort of ex staying on the, on the cutting edge in terms of being able to offer something that, that people want, but, but being able to find the right type of fitness product that, that you can do at a, at a good standard? Um, I think actually, um, and it's possibly not what you'd expect me to say, but 
I think that energy's greatest um, attribute, uh, and you might expect us to say it's this part of our product or it's this, it's actually that we've been very good at adapting. We've been very good at recognizing when is the time to change. Um, we, we use the term, and it's not mine, as you'll know, blue ocean. We're always looking for blue ocean. Why stay in a red ocean when you can find a blue one? There's always a red ocean where people are biting chunks out of each other. But if you can swim to a blue ocean space, then you don't need to. You can create a defendable clearing. And if you look at energy's history over a 15-year period, um, we've gone through many periods of change. So at the beginning, our clubs were um, very definitely mid-market. We had saunas and spa pools and swimming pools. And it was very much a mid-market proposition. And then we moved into our multi-site, multi-product period, where we developed a, um, a smaller, more compact club, dry, with no wet facilities. But we also developed alongside that our women's product, Energy Fitness for Women, Shock, which was our, a joint venture kids product. Um, and we also had uh, a great deal of success in developing um, other unique niche products. And we, and we rolled those out. And, and then we went um, um, through to around 2009 when we were part of that budget revolution when we launched Fit for Less. And we subsequently rolled out 70 Fit for Less clubs. So we, we were always changing and moving. And I think that um, the changes that have been made over the last three to four years, uh, where all of our clubs came to a single brand, Energy Fitness Clubs, Where You Belong, and a very unique formula, uh, where we have a five to seven and a half thousand square foot format, um, gym, changing rooms, um, uh, a yard, which is our functional training studio, we call it our functional playground, um, and good strength training area, good cardio area, and most importantly, um, fantastic local owner management and a host. So somebody that's there to see you into the club, see you out of the club and make sure you have a great time. And that format has become extremely successful. We call it high service, low cost. Um, we are most definitely a high service club, but we are also most definitely a low cost club. So we have a, a we have a what we call a hook and yield strategy. So our classic membership is very much in the budget zone. Um, our wow membership is um, somewhere between five and ten pounds higher than that per month. And our epic membership, which is our third tier membership, just being introduced, is our is our premium offer. And so it's about um, having a unique approach that's not simply a carbon copy of everybody else's. And we've got some very new innovations coming through now, including our amazing new digital channel uh, with VR using Oculus Quest, which we think is going to be a real first mover. And we'll wait to see how our members react to it. Yeah, I'd like to touch on digital. Um, I've got one more question on this, this, this point um, before I move on. So... I, I've, I've always seen you as being innovative. You know, whenever I see stuff, it's like, okay, they're doing this, they're trying this. And I guess it takes a lot of work to do that. And, and you know, when you, when you come up with new innovations, there's a lot of risk, experimentation, a lot of cost, and you're not always going to get it right. What have you found over over your career as does it take to build a team that's that's able to continue to evolve and, and and be able to experiment and get that get that right you know what, what what have you had to build within your business and um and, and i guess you you know you probably sort of got that together almost as you as you've returned you know in terms of people and 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 uh i guess culture um i think the first thing that i've, I've changed over the years is i used to surround myself with people like me i used to uh, i used to be attracted to finding staff that had the same skills, the same attributes, and the same failings as I had. And then I soon realized that that wasn't very clever, and that actually if I could start to attract members of the team that had different skills and thought differently, it would be harder work, I'd be challenged more, but we're much more likely to get better results. I don't know if you know the uh, the story of the uh, Challenger, uh, the what, terrible disaster when the Challenger space shuttle blew up. And they, uh, they were looking for what caused no, it. And, you know, no. there was an electrical fault and nobody could have known. And they did a Myers-Briggs test on them. So they, they, they checked, you know, what profiles they were. And what they realized only after the accident was there was nobody in there 
with an intuition. There was just nobody in that crew who just went, this doesn't feel right. This just doesn't feel right. We should stop. And that's why that disaster happened. Yes, there was an engineering fault, but there was a fault in the team as well. There was nobody in the team that just felt, had that, had that feeling part of their personality. And so I, I, I realized very early on that actually there's lots of different people with lots of different skills and lots of different attributes, but also lots of failings. And if you can get the right mix of people and make it okay to fail, make it okay to experiment, make it okay to have an idea that's maybe not exactly what you would have done, then that can work magic. And, and, and I think we've, we've created a mechanism. I'm, I'm a big, big follower of Jim, Jim Collins, Good to Great. And um, I'm, I've done a, a lot of work over 15 years on the Good to Great principles. And if you look at something like 3M, you know, 3M, why, why is 3M the success that it is? It's that way because there are mechanisms built into that business that make it what it is. And the reason it has as many profitable um, lines, you know, the concept of killing off the most profitable product to force innovation, the concept of having every member of staff spend 25% of their time in the working week on a product that doesn't exist yet. I mean, these are mechanisms designed to create innovation. Um, and they, they talk about it being a, a building a ticking clock rather than telling me time. You know, if I if I was able to tell you, Matthew, at any time, day or night, that today is such and such of March and it's this time, and I can tell you that by looking at the sky, you'd be pretty impressed, right until I get knocked over by a bus. Um, but if I actually showed you a watch and you'd never seen one before and that watch told you the time whenever you looked at it, that's much more impressive. And what we've got to learn to do is, is build clocks, not just tell the time. It's all in good being you know a charismatic leader but that won't make a business tick for 50 years. What will make a business tick way beyond when you're gone is building a clock, a mechanism that will see it long into an enduring company. That's why I'm so passionate about what Collins does. Mm. So moving on to digital then, um, you seem to be able to, I, I hate using this word pivot, but I, it, it seems to be the only word that explains it. But you seem to be able to pivot from a bricks and mortar business, selling memberships and 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 be able to be extremely successful at converting those people to, to an online uh, digital uh, membership. How long, how, how far in advance of the pandemic did you guys start thinking that this was going to be something that your business needed to, to to start investing in? Or was it something that you just did once you heard about it and you just quickly figured it out and, and created a product? No, it's been, it's been time to see. Look, we, we, um, we were already on to digital before the pandemic. So we were already working on this space, but not as vigorously. So a year ago, we were, we were, we, we were doing early investigations as to, I mean, we, we were probably looking at something nobody else really thought was that interesting, which is can you get people to actually work out online instead of in club? And um, we, we took a very different approach, as Energy Always does, and, and certainly in our BMF business. Um, so um, Chris, the chairman, and Bear himself had a very, very strong view of where the digital offering needed to be. Best way of describing it is um, with two two tenets to it. The first is it's omni-channel. So the way that energy are approaching this is we believe the market, the world has changed and it's changed forever. It's never going to go back to the way it was before. Um, you know, I would never have believed that you and I would do an interview this way because actually doing interviews over Zoom was such an alien thing for us before the pandemic. But this has become, you know, even my mum knows how to do this. So it's, it's actually something that's become very normal. It's become normalized. And people have realized it can work. So I think there is going to be some good and some bad that comes out of that. But the world has changed. You know, will people still work in offices? Will there be more of a blend of people working at home? Will there be actual conferences? Of course there will. But will there also be blended um, technological solutions like this one? Of course. So the way we're approaching it is this. If we can create a true omni-channel, we, we call it energy omni-channel. And we've got a new a, a new way of thinking about that. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say the brand right now because I, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder in our marketing team. Uh, but we're, we're coming to market with a very, very strong omni-channel. That means if you are 
um, somebody that wants to come back to the club, you feel safe indoors, and you want to work out in the club, our clubs are safe, and we're ready on April the 12th to be there for you, and we're going to give you an amazing experience. If you want to work outdoors, then we're there for you, and we can help you work out. If you're more comfortable outdoors, not a problem. We can do that at Energy and BMF are the specialists. And if you want to work out at home and you want us to put the services into your living room, we'll do that. In fact, we'll put it in your pocket so that if you're working away or you're at a hotel or on holiday, you can work out and do the same class you do every Wednesday night, no matter where you are. And I believe that it's that omni-channel, that putting the member in the center and then actually creating an indoor, outdoor and online, wherever you go, experience is going to be the key. The second thing is, I've been quite astounded. In the same way, I was a little bit surprised that everybody was so quick to freeze memberships. I've been a little bit surprised by how singularly dimensional the digital approach has been, i.e., what do you do? You offer group exercise, because that's the obvious thing to do. And you probably offer group exercise on one way street. You know, it's like watching Davina McCall, or it's like watching a workout on video, it's like watching body insanity, and all of those things that have been around forever. We took a very different approach. We said, okay, so. Yes, we can take a group exercise offering online, digitally, not a problem. And that will cater for about 10% of our members. But what about that, that guy or girl that comes into the club, puts their headphones in and runs on a treadmill? What about that person that actually isn't interested in group exercise, but they lift weights? What about that person that actually comes in and works out with their friend and they do um, a little bit of cardio and a little bit of weights? They're not the people that want necessarily to have group exercise. And what about all the other dimensions of wellness? So our digital platform is built on three pillars, fitness, nutrition, and mindset. In the fitness channel, we've got group exercise, we've got individual exercise, and we've got a whole range of support structures um, that do amazing things. Let me just give you one example. Um, so in, in BMF, in BMF, uh, one of our, I'm going I'm to credit him, Stuart Clark, um, actually created a running podcast. He realized that his members love going running with him, but right now under the rules, you can't do that. So every Sunday morning, he goes out running and members join him. To just give you an idea of how many members join him, he's had 100,000 downloads of his podcast. And last Friday, he had 4,000 downloads in one day. Now, this is a guy that goes running and chats to his members while running on a podcast in BMF. So we've got, one one franchisee there influencing a hundred thousand people running on a Sunday morning. Amazing. Kudos to him. Um, and, and it just shows that there's different yeah. sorts. You can't just force feed them group exercise. So within the fitness channel, we do group exercise, yes, but we also do a whole range of other things. And most importantly, we do it two way. It's through Zoom. So that way we're coaching the members. It's not one way broadcast. Secondly, nutrition, we do cook-alongs, uh, we do uh, recipe nights, uh, we've got a whole recipe portal, and we, we engage people on the nutrition dimension of their health, and there's a whole channel dealing with that. And then finally, mindset, and actually out of all of our digital offerings, meditation, who knew? Meditation is the most popular offering in our entire uh, planned week. So we have 50 classes a week, and meditation uh, seems to be getting uh, great uh, uh, certainly a great following. Um, so on demand and online, two-way, and in three weeks' time, uh, we're going to be launching something very exciting, Matthew. We're going to be launching the first ever health club experience through Oculus Quest uh, using VR technology, and we're very, very excited about that innovation. And is that, is that a product that you've, you've partnered or developed it yourself no we've, we've developed it ourselves so we uh we have a, a talented team of developers um i i've invested across a number of technology companies and uh one of the partner technology companies is is working with our developers uh, in order to bring the oculus quest app to market and we're about three weeks off we'll be bringing the first ever energy fitness oculus quest app that means that you can come to one of our clubs even when you're not there so, so what would that like? If you're able to share it, is that is that like um, you, you you sort of got? I've got an Oculus, and my my I have to hide it to keep my children out of it because they sort of lose themselves yeah, all the time. But 
But, when people but, misunderstand, they think an Oculus is a gaming a gaming uh, console. It's not. Oculus is a multimedia console, so it's um it's too, it, the game was changed when Oculus brought out the Quest, bringing the entry cost down from about three thousand pounds to two hundred ninety nine pounds, and so suddenly an all in unit with um, no sensors, no wires, and under three hundred pounds was there for the taking. And actually, in the UK, many many households now have them because people have had their kids crawling up their legs for the last six months, and uh, the Oculus Quest has become very popular. Well, the Oculus Quest is interesting because it's not a gaming console. It actually, you can get your Netflix, you can look at your social media, you can do your Facebook, you know this. So we've created, in the Oculus Quest, a complete digital fitness platform. So Energy will be the first fitness club uh, group to offer a full digital platform in Oculus Quest in full VR. So 360 workouts, you can actually do the workouts and you're in the middle of the action. You're not watching the film, you're in it. So it's a completely unique take. It, it's not going to be for everybody. Not everybody gets on with VR. Uh, but for those of our members that want a real immersive experience, uh, we're really excited to be the first mover in this marketplace. Mm. What, what are your thoughts about the future of digital? Like, Obviously, you're very confident because you're, you're investing in it. But I, I guess there's a lot of big players like the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Apples and all those people that seem to also be wanting to to get involved in this and and the the way the technology seems to be going is is they're able to do a good job how do you see small businesses like i guess in relation to those you you probably class as a sort of, sort of smaller business how do you see smaller businesses being able to, to stay in that space but but being able to to create a bit of a moat around what you're doing and, and and to be able to sort of differentiate yourselves and also keep up to the um keep keep up to speed with the rate that the technology is developing in terms of what platforms people are using and, and running some of this technology on sure um, so look I, you know, i've looked at the apple product it's fantastic i've got an apple watch myself it, it's great uh, you look at the peloton product it, it's fantastic but what is interesting about all of these is they're one way they, they they say it's interactive but it's not really you know okay look if, if you get excited about the fact that you're riding your bike and every third month somebody might shout hey matthew from bedford well i'm not sure if that's motivational or not why what, what i would say is there is a different way of doing it and that's two-way interactive like we're doing right now the technology is strong enough to be able to have a relationship with members and if you look at the energy digital platform we're not the only one but the energy digital platform leverages this technology where you can actually work with a member in close quarters. So whether that's 200 people in a class and an instructor being able to interact with somebody who looks like they're not uh, getting the most out of the class and actually seeing them physically in the class. Uh, we use my zone technology, we use the heart rates and we use MZ remote and through the fabulous technology that Dave and the team have developed combined with Zoom, we can put a real interactive class on. But equally, things like small group personal training. Now, we're not the only ones doing it, but what's interesting mm. is personal trainers are doing it best. It's not the big groups that are doing it best. Yeah. It's innovative personal trainers working out of their kitchens with their members in their kitchens uh, or their customers in their kitchens and doing a real interactive experience. So, look, it's horses for courses. There is no doubt on our digital platform, our one way broadcast, which is very much like Facebook Live that has its place it's it's very high production quality members love it it's terrific but there are some of our members that they want to see their friends they want to see the instructor that they love they want to feel that they're part of that community and i'm a great believer that if if you're a if you're actually somebody who goes to a, a regular boxing workout on a wednesday night i believe that it is possible to be part of a community because you go into a physical bricks and mortar club put your boxing gloves on and do that boxing class in that particular club. But equally, I think you could go to a boxing session on a Wednesday night where there are 40 people in that class, five from New York, two from California, three from Hong Kong and 10 from London. And if you know that group, that's your community. It doesn't matter where you are. We've seen that. The world has just got an awful lot smaller. So our approach is a little bit different than others. We're not Peloton. We're not aspiring to be. Uh, what they do is amazing, but it's different than what we do. Uh, we're also not Apple. But what we're creating is something quite unique. Um, the Oculus gives us a real edge technologically uh, because we're bringing something that nobody else has brought before. And even before we get to the Oculus, 
Um, we're bringing homegrown fitness um, that's authentic into the living room, into the pocket, and into where you are. And I think that makes all the difference. And whether it's um, BMF leveraging its technology um, so that their members can actually join an outdoor workout or its energy creating an omni-channel where it's indoor, outdoor, and online, um, I think we're doing some amazing things. Um, but we never, ever, ever think we've got it right. We're, we're constantly learning. So I'd like to think, uh, look back in five years and, and we'll know what we need to do next. You seem as though you're, and I may be wrong, but you, you seem as though you're quite a creative person and also a bit of a visionary. H how have, have you learned about yourself in terms of balancing that, you know, looking for the future, being creative, spotting new ideas, but but also balancing that between, like, you know, you've got lot, you know, a big team of people behind you. You've you've got you've got to sort of keep focused on what you're doing. How, how have you, you know, how, how do you sort of get get that balance uh, without right? going off, off track too much? Essentially, you sometimes think whether well, you made your life hard for yourself because I, I look at the team that I work with now, and you know, the team's evolved over the years. I know full well if I have, um, if I have, or remember the team has an innovative new idea. It does not simply get approved. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be a robust debate because there will be those in the team that will say, we've got to do this and we're going to do it immediately. There will also be those in the team saying it's a distraction. We should focus on what we do well. We shouldn't do anything new. There will be somebody else in the team that says, no, change has always served us. And I love that we debate that. I love that I don't know where that's going to land. Now, at the end of the day, okay, I've got to make decisions. But we have a really healthy respect for each other. And there are many, many things that I thought we should do that members of my team have persuaded me we absolutely shouldn't. And there are things that I wasn't sure we should do that they've taken me with them. So it's most certainly not always what I want us to do, but I'm quite good at stimulating the debate that gets us to the right place. Um, and I, I kind of like that I don't know where we're going. Look, I know that 10 years from now, um, energy is still going to be a pioneering company. It's still going to be empowering people to transform their lives. We're still going to be sitting within our four values, and we're still going to be growing. I don't know who's going to be steering the ship at that point. I'd like to think I've made that re retirement by that point. <laughs> but I, I'd like to think also that, you know, when I get to 70, 75 years old and I look back, and hopefully if I'm still here, I can say, Do you know what, I worked there once and I had a bit of influence. That would be nice. So a couple of questions as we wrap up then, Dan. Um, what, what's, your, what is, what's your predictions on next 18 months for the fitness industry? You know, UK opens in a, in a few months and people are, you know, going to deal with the various sort of, you know, the new, um, I guess, rules that, that are around that. And, I, and we can see that happening in other parts of the world as well. So if you look at the sort of global fitness industry, I know it's going to be different in different regions, but in general, are you sort of fairly optimistic about that? And, and are there any sort of major changes that you see post-pandemic that probably weren't there before we came into it? Yeah, look, I, I think, as I said before, I think the market's changed forever. I, don't, I think anybody that's going to – I'm sure you've read the, the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Now, I think anybody that's just sitting there wondering when the cheese is coming back, uh, they, need to, they need to wake up and put the trainers on, get ready for running, because the reality is the market's changed. Now, I think that this, is, this has challenged us. And I think it's going to make us stronger, Matthew. I really do. I think we're going to get stronger technologically. I think we're going to be more ready for change and innovation. Um, I think that we have experienced challenge. That you know, we all know how do you make how do you make the body change? You put it under strain, and you know, we all know the we we all know the principles of progressive resistance. A business is no different. Put it under pressure, and if you've got the right people and if you've got the right business concepts, it will respond. So I think we're going to see a number of things. Number one, we're going to see a recoil. There is definitely a pent-up demand. People are sick of being at home, and there is a pent-up demand. Certainly when the lockdown ended in November, we had the most amazing December we've ever had. So there is a pent-up demand, and there will be an initial recoil. And um, Then I think what we're going to find is that people don't want their fitness delivered in exactly the same way as they did before. Some people are going to want to work outdoors. That's why I'm so excited about where we're going with our BMF, uh, with with uh, the BMF product, and uh, Chris and Bear and the team at BMF. I've got amazing global plans for that product. Um, Energy is looking to work across the three um, indoor, outdoor, and online. Um, we've also um, go, we're going to see people uh, wanting to. I, I think maybe 
<laughs> I'd say be a bit more promiscuous. I don't know that people are simply going to say, yeah, I just have a membership of a club. I think what people are going to do is say, okay, do you know what? I have a membership of this club and I buy this boutique brand and I do this online. I think people are going to start having a menu of things that serve their fitness habit. Um, and I think people are going to be much more demanding of um, that flexibility. So I think that's going to change. Um, I think you're going to see some casualties. Um, I hate to say it. I love this industry. And I don't want to see anybody fall. I think it's inevitable. Um, and I hope the government is able to provide enough support um, to keep the industry standing. But I think there's going to be some casualties. But in that, I think there'll be some opportunities. Uh, we're certainly seeing those opportunities. Um, I was absolutely thrilled that um, when we bought the business back in June, um, the lockdown ended in July, Energy opened five new clubs in August, five in, in August, and all of those have beat their pre-sales targets. Um, we're now opening in April, uh, April the 12th, and we've got another eight clubs opening across England, Ireland, and Scotland. There's eight clubs opening immediately in the month after we reopen. So that's... You know, that's, that's 12, 13 clubs that we, we've opened during this period. So Lord only knows what the potential is um, afterwards. Uh, we're certainly still seeing lots of franchise inquiries, so that's, that's alive and well. Um, but what's the biggest change? Adoption of technology. I think technology is going to be sitting at the centre of it, and it's the reason I've invested in technology so heavily. Um, uh, Hedgehog, which is the software company that I've invested in, which actually has... Um, the, the membership system that runs energy. Um, I, I think we've got amazing potential for, for doing some really new, innovative things. Um, the, the team at Hedgehog, David War, the MD, there has such an amazing um, plan for how we can make people's lives easier. Um, and I think technology is going to be sitting at the core of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So final question then, Jan. Um, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible or others have believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a, a memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? Um, last March, when, when the pandemic hit and it became clear that I could either sit and watch the industry go into implosion and the business that I'd, I'd loved for 15 years go with it, or I could stand up and be counted and, 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 and work with a group of passionate people and a great bank to actually make sure that energy uh, had a great future ahead of it. Um, did I know? Did I know that we would have the success that we've had this year? No, I didn't. I, I couldn't have known. But did I have a confidence in the people in the business? Yeah, I did. Um, I didn't know how we were going to pull it off. I didn't know how we were going to get through such a bumpy period um, as a franchise business that doesn't have the depth of pockets of some of the own groups. No, I didn't have the answer to that question. I just had a confidence in the product, the brand, and the people, be it the franchisees, the staff, or the center. Um, and they've not let me down. Um, so it's it's... My, I would say that the, the business escaped its limits. You know, if we'd have been trapped by our limits, we'd have gone out of business. But actually, we've now got a bright future ahead of us thanks to people believing. <laughs> and I, I, I think you mentioned people believing, but I, you know, I love what you said, and I've, I've sort of built up a bit of a picture as we've gone on along. But I think probably one of the pers one of the people probably with the most belief. Um, it's probably yourself, and um, because you 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 sound crazy enough to to believe that you you know you would go into this and be able to find all these different ways to keep your business going, and 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 I think you've got to be a little bit crazy to to believe that because most people would just have given up, you know, very very early. Well, I, I can't remember which American sports coach it was that I stole this from. But I've always believed in the mantra of biting off more than you can chew and then chew like hell. And um, it's always served me well. Give me a small joy, but it's always served me well. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, there's some great lessons to people wherever you are. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're sort of feeling a little bit down and not sure where to turn, I, you know, I'd probably listen to this again because I, I think, you know, the big thing is, 
is 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 the mindset that's come out to, come out of this for me. And um, you know, as, as you said, you don't know you don't know where it's going to end up. No, nobody nobody told you whether any of these things are going to work or not. But you went into it with the mindset that I'm going to give it my best bet, and I'm going to believe in my people. And that's you know, that's, that's I'm sure that's a, a massive part of what's got you to where you are today. So. Um, so Jan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all the you know your experience with us, and uh, I wish pleasure, you Matthew. a lot of success in um, you know in the years to come. Thanks, Matthew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review. Leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.